final lesson. Not too long ago, we were talking with an old friend. To our astonishment, this successful and beautiful 43-year-old physician complained of being unhappy. She shared with us that she did not like her job, which really surprised us. We knew that she was a successful physician and professor of medicine at a major university. Still, she wanted more. But you've got a great career, we noted. Is there something wrong? I don't feel happy professionally. When she told us she didn't feel she was contributing enough to society, we asked, Don't you still spend every Friday volunteering at the free clinic? Don't you still lecture and teach for free whenever you can? You donate to quite a few charities too, right? Yes, she replied, but it's not enough. When she started talking about getting plastic surgery, we were floored. A simple facelift, she said, a chin implant, and a little collagen. There's nothing wrong with plastic surgery, but we were sitting with a beautiful woman who did not need any help and seemed to be aging without so much as a wrinkle. Finally, she asked us for our opinion. We looked at each other wondering who had taught our friend this nonsense. This woman, happily married, smart, successful, beautiful, wealthy, highly respected, had an embarrassment of riches, yet she felt as if she were underachieving, ungiving, and inferior looking. Perhaps she needed to work on her internals rather than her externals. If she couldn't feel the, the success she had, how could she feel any more? If she didn't appreciate her beauty now, why would she feel different after plastic surgery? If she didn't feel good about the gifts she was giving, would donating more time and money make a difference to her? Working on the externals wasn't helping. She needed to realize just how wonderful and giving she already was. Like this woman, most people today have been given everything they need to make their life work. Not everyone is as accomplished and as beautiful as she is. She is a good example only because she is such an obvious one. Most people have all they need to be happy, but are not. We're not happy with what we have accomplished, big or small. We are not content with our looks. But the truth is, we are never as unattractive as we feel. It's our inner experiences that are lacking. We have been given all we need to have a fulfilling, meaningful, and happy experience of life. We just don't recognize our own gifts or goodness. In counseling, people often discount or deny their goodness. Some of the most committed, giving, and loving people seem unaware of the impact they have on the world. From presidents of charities to the clergy, to those who work tirelessly to prevent intolerance, they seem painfully unaware of their goodness. They seem to lack the ability to see the truth about who they really are. We often share this story with these individuals. There once was a man with a pure heart who performed good deeds. He also made mistakes, but that didn't matter, not only because he did so many wonderful things, but because he learned from his errors. Unfortunately, he was so aware of his good deeds that he became full of himself. God realized that a good person who made mistakes but continued evolving would be okay, but one who became prideful would never find happiness. So he took away this man's ability to see his good deeds, saving that knowledge until his mortal work was done. The man continued doing good deeds, and all those around him appreciated them, but he himself never felt them or understood how much good he was doing. Finally, at the end of his life, God showed him all the good deeds he had done. Often, we don't recognize our goodness until the end of life. We need to remember that we are here to try to remember our goodness and remind each other 
of our preciousness and the miracle of each other. From the beginning to the end, life is a school complete with individualized tests and challenges. When we've learned all we can possibly learn, and when we have taught all we can possibly teach, we return home. It's sometimes hard to see what the lessons are. It's difficult to understand, for example, that children who die at age two may have come here to teach their parents about compassion and love. Not only may we have difficulty understanding what is being taught, we may never know which lessons we're supposed to master. It would be impossible to master them all perfectly, and there are undoubtedly some dragons we're not supposed to slay this lifetime. Sometimes not slaying them is the lesson. It's easy to look at someone and say, Oh, it's so sad, he didn't get the lesson of forgiveness before he died. But maybe he still learned what he was supposed to. Or perhaps he was presented with opportunities to learn, but chose not to. And who knows? Maybe he wasn't supposed to get the lesson by forgiving. Perhaps you were offered an opportunity to get the lesson of forgiveness by watching him. While we all learn, we also all teach. When people are buffeted by seemingly endless windstorms and their lives look like calamities, they may wonder why they have been given so many tests and why God appears to be so merciless. Going through hardship is like being a rock in a tumbler. You're tossed to and fro and get bruised, but you come out more polished and valuable than ever. You are now prepared for even bigger lessons, bigger challenges, and a bigger life. All the nightmares are turned into blessings that become part of living. If we had shielded the Grand Canyon from the windstorms that created it, we would not see the beauty of its carvings. That may be why so many patients have told us that if they could magically go back to the point right before they got their cancer or other life-challenging disease and erase what was to come, they would not. In so many ways, loss shows us what is precious, while love teaches us who we are. Relationships remind us of ourselves and provide wondrous opportunities for growth. Fear, anger, guilt, patience, and even time become our greatest teachers. Even in our darkest hours, we are growing. It's important that you know who you are in this lifetime. In our growth, even our greatest fear, death, becomes less and less. Think about what Michelangelo pointed out. If life was found to be agreeable, then so should death be. It comes from the hand of the same master. In other words, the same hand that gives us life, happiness, love, and more isn't going to make death a horrible experience. As someone once said, endings are just beginnings backwards. In the beginning of this book, Michelangelo told us the beautiful sculptures he created were already there, inside the stones. He simply removed the excess to reveal the precious essence that had always been there. You do the same thing as you learn lessons in life. You chip away the excess to reveal the wonderful you inside. Some of our greatest gifts from God may be answered prayers, but for all we know, the unanswered ones may also contain gifts. In exploring the lessons from the edge of life, we become more comfortable with the knowledge that life ends one day. We also become more aware of life happening now. As we wrote this book, we ourselves continue to learn these lessons. No one has internalized them all. If we had, we would no longer be here. As we all still teach, we all still learn. It's hard to deal with death before we have to, but it is at the very essence of life. 
We've asked the dying to be our teachers because we can't experiment with death or experience it ahead of time. We must rely on those who have faced life-challenging illnesses to be our instructors. People make enormous changes at the very end of their lives. We wrote this book to take the lessons from the edge of life and give them to people who still have lots of time to make changes and to enjoy the results. One of the most surprising lessons our teachers offer is that life doesn't end with a diagnosis of a life-challenging illness. That's when it truly begins. It begins at this point because when you acknowledge the reality of your death, you also have to acknowledge the reality of your life. You realize that you are still alive, that you have to live your life now, and that you only have this life now. The primary lesson the dying teach us is to live every day to its fullest. When was the last time you really looked at the sea or smelled the morning, touched a baby's hair, really tasted and enjoyed food, walked barefoot in the grass, looked into the blue sky? These are all experiences that, for all we know, we may never get again. It's always eye-opening to hear the dying say that they just want to see the stars one more time or to gaze out at, on the ocean. Many of us live near the ocean but never take the time to look at it. We all live under the stars, but do we look up at the sky? Do we really touch and taste life? Do we see and feel the extraordinary, especially in the ordinary? There is a saying that every time a baby is born, God has decided that the world will continue. In the same way, every day you wake up, you've been given another day of life to experience. When was the last time you fully experienced that day? You don't get another life like this one. You will never again play this role and experience this life as it's been given to you. You will never again experience the world as in this life, in this set of circumstances, in quite this way, with these parents, children, and families. You will never have quite this set of friends again. You will never experience the earth with all its wonders in this time again. Don't wait for one last look at the ocean, the sky, the stars, or a loved one. Go look now.